um, <coughs> I'd like to do our last um, <coughs> talk on sort of family and communication problems. And um, just we'll focus in on a couple of tips for trying to ease the tension between family members uh, in clinical practice. I don't expect that we're going to become therapists, but there's some things that we can do that would assist parents, and uh, particularly with teenagers, in terms of dealing with some of the um, s struggles and conflicts that, that often go on. So here's our case scenario. So Thomas is a 14-year-old teenager. He's become increasingly moody and oppositional. That he's rude when they speak with when the parents speak with him. He spends a lot of time in his room listening to music, texting his friends. His grades have been dropping. His parents are concerned and want to know how they can discuss their concerns with him without provoking an argument. Difficult. <laughs> so there are some basic techniques I think that we can teach parents in a in a primary care setting in terms of just how to talk to their kids um, in a neutral way, in a non-judgmental way that will not necessarily spawn conflict. So our, the handout also um, has uh, lots of material in there um, that, that you can read about. But I think um, just as we're taught some of these techniques when we're communicating with patients, sometimes parents can, and, and the kids themselves can be taught some ways to talk to each other so that they can actually hear each other out and not get into a patterned um, uh, argument. So one of the active listening, um, and it's just simply, you know, um, taking, taking a listen to what's going on and just simply saying, processing what they just said. It sounds like blah, blah, blah. So child comes home and says, you know, my teacher was screaming at me all day today and I had a horrible day and, uh, blah, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the parents initial response would be, you know, well, what did you do wrong? <laughs> well, that's just going to provoke an argument or conflict. Um, but another tact that you might teach a family is, you know, sounds like um, you're really upset about what happened in, in school today. Um, that opens up the discussion now without a conflict and without, uh, without argument. And just simply teaching a parent who may not know how to do that to do that may, may really be um, a, a, a great facilitator in improving communication in the family. Teaching I versus you messages. Are, are people familiar with I versus you messages? So a <clears throat> teenager comes home late from you know, going out with his friends and parent immediately says, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you really, you know, you always go come in late and I'm really sick and tired of this and you're gonna be grounded forever and da, 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 da. But um, again, that's, that's an attack message, and that's, that kid's not going to listen to what the parent said. Um, a much better approach, if a parent wants to communicate, would be using an I message. Um, I am upset because you came in late, and when you come in late, it just makes me worry. I don't know what happened to you. What a difference between communicating, and that's really what the parent does want to say to the kids usually. and what an effective way to say it without going on the attack. So just simply changing the focus of the dialogue can often uh, make a huge difference. You know, a parent in this scenario we just read can, might want to ask permission. You know, we're really upset about some of the things you've been doing recently, and we, you know, can we talk about it? You know, you know it's bothering us, um, you know, and, um, you know, you and myself and your mom are both really concerned, and we'd like to talk to you about this. Be prepared for the for the possibility that you'll get shut down. But if it's an, if 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 it's done in a moment where there's not in heated debate, and the parent has a good relationship with the teenager, more than likely they're going to sort of listen to what the parent has to say if it's brought up in a in a way in a delicate way. And and the other thing that parents can do is just use open-ended questions like we're taught to do. Um, tell me what happened. It's a simple phrase, and, and it opens up a whole discussion. Um, you know, I, my, you know I, my friends are, you know, aren't talking to me. Um, I really feel isolated, and you know, you know, everybody's angry at me, and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, well, well, tell me what's going on. Tell me what happened. Um, you know, versus, well, you know, what did you do to your friends? <laughs> it's two different approaches, but one facilitates communication and one doesn't.
So if parents can be taught some of these simple techniques, which they can, um, and they can use them and, pr and practice them, and sometimes even in a, in a, in a room in the office, one, you could have a parent say, you know, could you, could you say that in a different way? You know, you're, you just told your son that you're really angry because he comes in late, you know, when he's out with his friends and you just kind of berate him. Can you say, try an iMessage, say the same thing, but try, practice it. And you can just have them practice in a setting. It only takes a few moments, but it could be very, very um, empowering and improve the dialogue that goes on in the family. This is an example of bad <laughs> active listening. You know, we don't want people to become automatons, you know, so why, hi, honey. Oh, you are opening the conversation with a greeting. <laughs> ah, yes, I wanted to know how you were and what happened to the kids today. You are showing concern with the state of my health, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the point is, you know, it gets kind of hokey if it's not done right. But, um, you know, if, if it's done in, in, a, in a serious way where the person, where the parent really is interested in hearing what, 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 what's, um, what's going on, um, then, then I think um, it will open up the dialogue. Oops. How about problem solving? Um, that I, I spend a fair amount of time um, with families who come in with a problem, and often some of the problem can be solved by just having a, 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 a sort of a neutral discussion in the office and having everybody in an unheated moment talk about what the issues are, identify the problem, and then try to come up with some ideas in terms of what are we going to do to solve this. So the first thing is identifying the problem, you know, brainstorming. So that's the opportunity for everybody to kind of come up with even the most outrageous ideas about, you know, how we might do this. And then we ask the family and, and the teenager to, the parents and teenager to select a, a solution and figure out how we're going to implement something that everybody can live with. But identifying the problem is often the most difficult thing, because when you say, well, what's the problem, then everybody goes on the attack again. So the parents are, you know, he doesn't listen, he comes in late, you know, he curses at me, he blah, 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 I don't like his friends, I don't like his clothes, you know, and then he starts to get, well, that's not really identifying the problem, you know, that's sort of berating the, the teenager, and that's not going to open up a dialogue. Um, and, or the teenager says, you know, my parents are getting on my nerves, they're always in my face, da 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 da, and, they, and that's an attack message also. So that's again where we can say, well, can you use that? Can we say um, the same thing using an I message? T tell each other what your concerns are without going on the attack. But more importantly, you know, helping to define what the issue is. So there's a, 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 um, something called solution focused therapy, which looks at trying to identify concerns in a way that is positive and gets people to really begin to look at what they can do to solve the problem. So if the problem is articulated in a way that makes it sort of um, susceptible to, to some intervention, they can solve the problem. So what, 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 do, we, what do we mean by solution-focused approach? Um, rather than have a parent say, you know, he's bad, he does this all the time, he does that all the time, this all the time. You know, the question is, what are you concerned about? What specifically is the concern that you have? But even more importantly, what is this going to look like when it's going well? And that's a really important question to ask. So um, if you can ask them, you know, supposing I sort of walked past your house um, when things are going well, what would I see you all be doing differently that you're not doing now? Now the family can start to think about, well, what are we, what's the goal? What are we trying to get to? So instead of saying he comes in late all the time, you know, he would come in on time. He, might be, you know, he would talk to us in a, more, in a quiet, more respectful way. Um, you know, my parents would stop yelling at me when they're upset. You know, we can say, what we want to say is we would all be getting along. We'd be talking in quiet voice and having a civil dialogue. And that's now the goal. You know, now we have something we can kind of try to, to approach and, and get to. You know, versus just say, well, he's bad, he talks back, he's obnoxious, my, my parents are pains in the ass. Um, you know, now we have a solution-focused approach. I would, you know, we want to see something where everybody's getting along positively, speaking in civil tone, and, um, and not cursing at each other. Now we have a goal that we can, are, you know, can actually visualize. And we can say, you know, if we had a video camera, what would we see on the video camera? If I were a fly on the wall, <laughs> you know, what would I see you doing differently? And, now, and that's how we can get to some of that. 
Um, or we can use a miracle question. You know, if I, could, if I could wave a wand and make everything improve overnight, what would we see you all doing differently than you're doing now? So those are some ways to get the family to refocus, to get off the negative stuff and onto the sort of more positive solution um, focused um, uh, identification of the problem. Another thing that uh, it's important to ask are what are the exceptions? When are things, you know, are the, you, I know you can't be arguing 100% of the time. There must be times when things are going smoothly in your home. What's happening then that's different? And if they could start to look at the things that are going on when everybody's calm and there's peace in the house and sort of, sort of pick up on those things um, and do more of them. So that's one of the goals of, 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 this, of, of identifying what are the exceptions. You know, when do things go well and what's happening at those times that's different. Um, we want to frame things in a positive way. So we want to, you know, as I said a few moments ago, the problem is not that he talks back. You know, what we want to see is I'd like him to um, talk to us respectfully. And for younger kids, when we identify the problem, sometimes we, can, we need to externalize the problem. You know, what's going on and, um, um, you know, for the kid who's anxious, um, sometimes we'll talk about um, externalizing it so that the, um, the, the child talks about the, the worry monster. <laughs> the worry monster um, is getting to me and makes me really upset. And then we have something that we can identify. We can have a kid draw a picture of the worry monster. We can talk about how we're going to handle the worry monster to, to reduce its powers. And, and it, it frames it in a much more concrete way for younger children. But these are the kinds of things we can do to identify a problem so we have a starting place that we can then intervene. And then I ask families to um, think about all the possible things that we could be doing differently that everybody can live with. And some of the most outrageous things may come up out of the discussion, and that's OK. At this point, you just want people just to throw ideas out. And it's much better if the family does it. So I think that's a key point. Um, I, you want to be just sitting quietly. You can kind of say, well, have you thought about this? Or some other people sometimes have considered doing this. But I think the clinician should really let the family own this and sort out, sort out how they're going to do this. And they'll own it. And they're much more likely to implement it if it's something that they kind of worked on mutually and they're happy with. Um, if it's assigned to them, they're less likely, I think, to comply. So when we get to the problem, now, now we want to sort of deci decide how we're going to go about doing this. Um, we'd like to think about some clear solutions. What is something that we both can live with? So if they, perhaps if they're arguing about coming in late, the parent can say, you know, again, use an iMessage. It gets me really upset when you come in late. I really would need you to come in on time. You know, you need to be in by 11 or 11.30 on Friday night. Um, and, you know, the, the um, teenager needs to basically come, say, you know, I, you know, come up with, yes, I can live with that. You know, can we make it 11.45? You know, what's the wiggle room here? What if I'm five minutes late? You know, and come up with the contingency plans for what's working. And the parent will say, you know, okay, all right, I can live with you coming in between 11 and 30 and 11.45, but if you come in beyond that, there will be a consequence. You know, and can you live with that? And, you know, hopefully everybody can shake hands and come up with some, some agreement. And if the, this particular kid comes in after 11.45, there's, a, there's an agreement that there'll be a, 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 a consequence, and that can be discussed at the time of the meeting as well. All right, what's going to happen if you show up at, at midnight? What, you know, you're going to have to come in a half hour early next time, or you're going to lose certain privileges, or um, you can't have the keys to the car next time, et cetera. But there's going to be a consequence to sign. If you, if you agree with this compromise that we just negotiated, things will go smoothly. And, this, you know, and then again, can we all live with this um, compromise? Maybe the parent wanted them to come in at 11, and the, the teenager wants to come in at 11.30. You know, and the parents say, all right, I can live with 11.30, you know, so there's not a fight every Friday night. And that's how they negotiate. And it's flexible, as we were saying before. A lot of this, you just have to kind of go with the flow in terms of what's happening in the room and where people are at in terms of how invested they are and how willing they are to compromise. But if we can get people to kind of soften their sort of stance on things and come up with something they both can live with, we often can come up with a good strategy for intervening that, that can be very effective. Um, and then the contingency plans, you know, are, are put into place. You know, how is this going to be enacted? When are we going to start? 
um, you know, what, what happens if, you know, the plan isn't going right? What are we going to do to kind of, um, kind of fine tune this? Um, maybe it requires coming back. Maybe it's so out of control that at that point, I would want to refer the family to a family therapist or to a, someone else who, who can really work with them in a more, in a more intensively because there's more going on than just simply arguing about things. So, you know, that's what we're trying to feel out. But, but this can all be done in a 30-minute session with a family, and it's amazing what comes out sometimes in terms of good ideas that they generate on their own and people kind of leave enthusiastic and ready to sort of start over. So I think it can be a very effective intervention for someone in primary care. Sometimes we can help people reframe um, a problem. So I like to use an example of um, bedwetting. You know, people come in and they are, you know, just upset, upset, upset about this bedwetting problem that's been going on. And what we'll talk about is like, well, out of the 24 hours in a day, how many minutes does this problem really occur? <laughs> Which is something that people really don't think about. Well, it only occurs over a 30 second period. So, we're, you know, are, is it really worth that getting this stressed out of something that occurs only 30 seconds in a 24 hour period? And if you frame it that way, it also makes it sound like something that you actually can do something about. So all I have to do is change my behavior over this 30 seconds and this problem may get better. But it just puts it in a different perspective for people who are often feeling overwhelmed. And, and it's just reframing the problem sometimes will just give people a different orientation. In many families, I find, and, and so does you know, the family therapy literature suggests that, that often you have a dynamic where one of the caretakers is, is very, very involved in the problem, and the other one is very peripheral. So it's not unusual to see a, a, a mother who's very involved in this particular problem and conflict, and the father who's very peripheral, although it could be reverse, or it could be a grandparent and a parent. But the dynamic is often there. There's this triad with a very over-involved person and a very peripherally involved person. And one of the th effective things to do is to kind of restore some balance in the family. So if I have um, a kid who doesn't want to go to school or get dressed every morning and the mother is pulling her hair and can't get the kid out the door and da-da-da-da, one of the interventions might be to have the father take over that responsibility. It's not always possible, but if they can, it actually can be very, very effective and say, Mom, you know, you have, you're getting a break this morning. It's not your responsibility. You know, father's going to get the child to school, make sure that they get dressed, et cetera. And that often can relieve the problem because it changes the dynamics of what's going on between the family members. So um, getting the, giving a parent a time off. You know, the over-involved over parent can be told, you know, take an evening a week where you can go out and just do something by yourself or with your friends that you enjoy doing and just take a break and have the less involved person be responsible for kind of watching the kids during that time. And that can often restore some of the dynamics as well. And for parents who are not getting along or very well or feeling stressed, if it's possible, try to give the parents some time off together where they can go out you know, on a, on a regular basis and just go out for a meal or a movie or do something that they find relaxing. And that can be very restorative in terms of um, how things um, proceed in that family. So these are simple interventions that people in therapy use, but, but they can be done in primary care settings as well. And sometimes people just need permission from a professional to do these things. Some other things that sometimes are helpful in terms of just changing the dynamics of what's going on. Um, how about scheduling the argument? And I tell people, you know, you can, do, um, you can have your argument by email. <laughs> um, it changes the dynamics so they're not sitting in their faces and screaming. Um, do it with humor. You know, have somebody put on Groucho Marx glasses when they're arguing. It's really hard to be screaming and yelling at somebody who's wearing Groucho Marx glasses. But again, it, sh it shifts what's going on. And you have to be careful with some of these things because it's not going to work for all families. But if you have a family that you know and they, they seem to be kind of, you know, working with you and, and there's not a huge amount of anger going on, you know, they can integrate some of these things. And it might just sort of change the dynamics enough to just kind of get them out of the, the, the locked in cycle that they often get locked into. So, um, and then setting ground rules for the arguments. You know, if you're going to argue, you know, here's the rules. You know, you're not going to curse at me. I won't curse at you. You know, we're going to talk civilly. Um, and um, 
you know, and enforce that. And that's very important in terms of keeping the, the um, things from getting really heated and out of control. And I think we talked about special time earlier. This is a time in adolescence where I think it's really, really important, for, particularly for parents who are having conflicts with their kids, just to sort of schedule some time on a regular basis to do something that they both can enjoy and they have some downtime. Um, I'm, I'm, my daughter's in college um, and she's uh, in St. Louis right now and I'm flying out th later this week to drive, but she has a car out there, we're driving back to Baltimore from, from, from St. Louis. And I'm actually looking forward to having, you know, 12 hours, 14 hours in the car, but I haven't really seen her a lot over the last year and it's gonna be a nice time for us just to kind of reconnect for a few hours while we're sitting driving back. Um, and um, if you have a good relationship with the kids, this is, can be a lot of fun to do, and it really opens up the opportunity for people to have dialogue. Um, a lot of kids will open up when, pe when they're simply being driven in the car somewhere, um, and it doesn't have to be formal time, but or just going out for a meal together, or just doing something, going to a movie together, and just having some nice time where things are just enjoyable, I think is so vital, and it should really be something that's encouraged in all families. Now, sometimes we see the families, and they're so past all that that they don't want to spend time together. But if you can get them in an earlier phase, I think it's just really, really important. So again, these are things that we can recommend to families that they do. And it really makes um, for much better communication and dialogue. And, and I mentioned earlier, I think that the areas where kids really have um, difficulty um, in terms of communicating with their families are areas around sexuality and substance abuse. And um, if, a, if a parent is going to become very autocratic and can't let go of their need to control what's going on, particularly with a mid to la later adolescent, they're really going to lose a lot because those kids are just going to find ways to um, undermine what's going on and not communicate. But if the parents really want to know what's going on with their kids and they have a good relationship, I think kids will talk about their sexuality if they know the parents aren't going to go ballistic. And I think the kids will talk about their um, use of drugs if they know the parents aren't going to go ballistic. And you know, frequently, I'm sure people have the same experience. I have kids who I see um, who come in for a well-child visit. You know, they inform me when the parents out of the room that they're having sex. Um, you know, and then I'll ask, you know, is this something that your family knows about? And sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they say no. I said, is there a reason that you can't talk to your parents about this? Because I think this is really important, and rather doing it on the sly, it really would be better if they are here with you to support you, kind of help you find the resources you need and talk to you about what's going on. Um, and some of them will say, yes, you know, I'd like to do that. I just couldn't do it by myself. And again, we can facilitate that. Some of them say, absolutely not. No way, don't tell my parent they're gonna you know, kill me. But you know, if they have a good relationship, we can have those conversations and dialogue in the office. And it's, the parents can't be there and I tell parents to acknowledge with their kids that, you know, I, you know, I can't be with you 100% of the day. I don't know what you're doing. I'm working, I get home late, and, you know, you're going to be doing things, you know, if they have access to a car, you're going to be doing things that, that um, I can't see what you're doing every minute of the day. And um, I have to trust that, you know, you're going to make the right decision. So these kinds of things build trust. And a good relationship is built on trust. And I think the consequence, the natural consequence for teenagers who do things behind their back is that they have breached the trust of their parents. That's a very, very powerful consequence for, um, for their behaviors. And if, they, if the parents have put the, the money into, this, into the account, the bank account, over time and have a good relationship, they, they can um, capitalize on that good relationship to ensure that the kids will be trusting and that will do things that are trustworthy with them. So I think on that note, I'm going to stop. <laughs> and see if there are any other questions. And the, I do need to ask you to please take the last few minutes to fill out the um, questionnaires, the post-conference questionnaire, and then there's an Academy of Pediatrics questionnaire in there as well that has to be filled out for you to get your CMEs. And um, if you've left it registered here, um, all the information will go to the Maryland chapter of the Academy and you will be getting um, your information about your CMEs hopefully in the next week or so. And if not, just call the Maryland chapter to inform um, Katie Franklin that you didn't